Hello everybody, welcome back. I'm the Strategy Professor, and today we're going to be going over the tier list for uh, 1219. So as always, if you enjoy the content, please be sure to like and subscribe. It really helps out a ton on the channel. Come by, check out the stream. We stream every night starting around 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Usually go until about 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's a very friendly, chill community. We'd love to have you. Uh, be sure to check out the rest of the content on the channel as well. I know I haven't put out as much in the last couple of weeks, so I apologize for that between illnesses and family and just other events. Um, I have kept up with most of the streams, but I know I kind of dropped the ball a little bit on the tier list, but I'm going to get back on it and do the support tier list and the ADC tier list, at least on this patch. And I'll see if I can do a few more rolls as well. And I'm also going to do um, some analysis videos of some of the changes that they have for the preseason that are coming up. So be sure to stay tuned for that as well. Um, as far as the patch notes go, I don't know if I'm going to do a full separate video because there's not a there's some interesting changes, but I'm not sure if all of them are going to really impact the meta that much. So I'll just hit the highlights here. Syndra, I'm not going to talk about. There's just so many there, and frankly, I just don't know how that's going to shake out. It seems to be possibly a little bit stronger. I don't think that's for Syndra support, though. Um, you really want to be able to level up with these changes, so that's going to be for solo lane. Blitzcrank um, is on the list. We'll mention him. I really don't think it's going to change that much about his play style. I know people are asking me on stream. Um, do I think that people are going to be going like some kind of bruiser auto attack based blitzcrank? I don't think so. Um, especially as support, you're just not going to have the gold for something like that. And in general, you know, he just doesn't have a lot of great ways to stick to people, you know, once he's in combat. He's really all about pulling them out of position and blowing them up. I mean, I think that's still his core identity. It is possible that you could see a jungle blitzcrank maybe i'm still doubtful of that but they did increase how much damage you know his w does to non um non champions aka monsters in the jungle so i mean we'll see there could be some interesting changes to it but i think by and large it's going to be the same thing you're probably going to build him tanky and you're probably just going to try to pull him in and blow him up um, they did increase the AP ratio on a few things, so there's a chance you... And they did this on several champions. Um, if you did see an AP item on him, it's probably going to be... Um, I'm blanking on the name, but the, the Everfrost. There we go. Because um, that would add extra CC, a little bit of extra burst damage, and it's just a really good item in terms of overall stats. So there's a chance that you could see that on him if people want a little bit more burst, which I don't think would necessarily be a bad thing. But I think that's about the only thing you might see that would change is people might build an AP item on him just because he got um, some more tantalizing ratios. But other than that, um, probably not that different. As far as the ADC meta and how that'll affect supports, I don't think it's going to shake up too much. There's not a nerf to Misfortune, so she's still going to be good. Jinx might be a little bit better. Um, they did increase the rockets, so it's kind of protect the back line, auto attack type champion. And then Kai'Sa is popular right now in the meta. I don't think she's overwhelmingly strong in solo queue. I know she's pretty good in pro. She's used... I think against Misfortune a lot of times because you can reposition around Misfortune's ultimate so easily with your R or with your E. And you're very good at dueling her if you can catch her out. Um, so they're increasing the AP ratio and stuff. AP Kais is not really a thing right now, so I don't think that's going to matter um, too much in the long run. Malphite, uh, I didn't put him on the tier list, but I could see putting Malphite in like C tier, so just like playable, maybe not optimal in all circumstances. But that ult is undeniably very powerful. I mean, it's a great engage, especially against things like a Misfortune, who don't have a lot of mobility. Misfortune, Jin. Now, Jin's probably going to take Gale Force. I guess some Misfortunes might take Gale Force. I think a lot of them are going Kraken. Probably depends on the matchup. Um, but if you're against, you know, an immobile ADC or, like, a really squishy Enchanter before they get a lot of items, um, you can definitely use that Malphite ult to blow people up. And they've made that a little bit better with AP, Again, I think Everfrost will be the choice because then you can chain the CC together. You get a little bit more burst. So Everfrost is probably where you want to be if you want to try that out. Um, you could also do Night Harvester for more burst. It does a little bit more than Everfrost um, if you hit it, but Everfrost is going to come with that mana um, as well, and then Everfrost is going to have more CC that you can chain together. So that will probably be the ticket. Um, not that great during the laning phase, but once you hit six, you definitely would have kill threat. So I'd say probably like C tier. Um, 
Nunu, now they're giving him a bigger AP ratio, and I've always wondered, because he's got some pretty big AP ratios, if you could make him work as like a, you know, flanking, ganking support type of thing, it's always had a pretty low win rate, but if you want to try it, you can gank your own lane, you could roam middle pretty well, um, if you want to try for like an Everfrost and then utility build, it's possible, you do have sustain in your lane, you have a lot of CC, so, I mean, there's potential, if you can get some good ganks off, I think it's there, but, um, I don't know. They're trying to make it a little bit more enticing with the ratio here, but I'm not quite sure it's enough to help. Now, Rakan, everybody knows that I love Rakan. Um, and I do think AP Rakan is pretty viable. I had some decent success rate on him. Um, so you're getting an extra 10% on your passives. So that's really good. And remember that this will still help Rakan no matter what in a lot of circumstances because Shirelia's at least is going to have 40 AP on it. Um, so you're going to get a little bit more value there. But the question is, you know, how much do you want to lean into that AP? How much do you want to lean into the burst? And this is going to make options like Everfrost or Night Harvester uh, potentially a little bit more appealing. And I hadn't really tried the build where you get like three points of Q in lane and then max W after that. So just end up with one point in your E and just go like full on offense. Um, and see if you can blow people up. So maybe that'll work in some squishy matchups. Rakan does have pretty easy access to the back line in a lot of circumstances. There are some champions that can peel him, but he's harder to peel than a lot of other champs just because he can you know, physically run through the front line. They can't body block his W. They have to CC him. Um, so that'll be something interesting to consider. I don't know if it'll be mainstream. Um, Sona is getting a little bit more damage on her Q. I don't think that's probably enough. The extra slow is nice, but I still think she's going to be pretty vulnerable in this meta. We'll talk about the meta here in a second. And then this is a very interesting one, this Tom Kench. Uh, these changes, that's pretty significant. They're giving him 20% more AP on his Q, and they're giving him 25% more on his W. So that's quite a lot. Now, I didn't look... Um, let me see what his win rate is. I suspect it's probably not great with that. But I mean, there has to be some number that they can put on his abilities that would make people want to do AP on it. I'm not sure if they're at that number yet, but they have consistently buffed this a lot over time. Well, he's over 50%. Looks like most people are still going tank stuff. Um, There's just not there's not enough data, I don't think. I mean, obviously, like, Everfrost looks bad right here, but it's only six games played. But that is the item that I think would have potential with Kench. We'll talk about Kench a little bit more later. But I think with these ratios, you could try, like, an Everfrost, um, Demonic Embrace type of build, maybe. Again, maybe that's a bait. There, there's just no data on it whatsoever. Um, so... You know, we'll have to see. We'll talk about him a little bit more in a minute. But those are like the major changes, uh, I think, that were notable. Eclipse gets nerfed some. I think that's a nerf. That's a nerf to early game burst. So that's going to encourage more champions, obviously, to build alternative stuff. So things that could build Eclipse but can also build crit will probably just want to go crit most times. So Misfortune's one person who lately has been building crit instead of um, Eclipse. So I don't think that's going to shake up the bot lane meta too much. But anyways, okay, let's get into the list. So um, number one up, I think, is Maokai. And again, I know I didn't do the list um, for the last couple of patches, I don't believe. But there definitely has been a pretty major shift for those of you that are just now catching up with my videos um, that haven't really been keeping up with the meta. And I think a huge part of that shift, Malachi got a bunch of individual changes, but you'll see this as a theme on a lot of these successful champions is the even shroud adjustment. So they buffed even shroud to where it went from nine damage for four seconds to 10 damage for five seconds. So that's pretty significant, especially that it's up for 25% more time. Um, and it's already, like, was a pretty good item. You know, it's not quite cost efficient, but if you include, you know, the mythic uh, passive and the fact that your gold item is going to be transformed by the time you get this, uh, it's pretty close to gold efficient. 
and then it, it increases the damage of everybody by 10%. And it's not only people that you CC, it's people that also CC you. So if you're a tank and you get CC'd, um, then it's going to extend that duration. Or if they open on you in close range, then it's going to trigger it. So it's just really easy to keep this up for a long period of time with some of these tanks that have a lot of CC. And Maokai is going to be one of the very obvious ones because he has three different abilities that trigger this. Right, he's got his ultimate that's got a root, he has his W that's a root, and he has his Q, which counts as a displacement if they're close enough for the knockback. Um, so you'll see a lot of the top ends champs um, that'll be taking even shroud, and that's been a major contributor to why tanks uh, have come back into the meta overall is that even shroud change. They did also nerf um, a few of the enchanters, most notably Lulu was hard nerfed and some of those hyper carries that scaled really well with enchanters like Ziri um, and Sivir got nerfed. So it's become a lot more about kind of burst damage and being able to establish yourself in that early to mid game, especially for some of those early key fights around dragon. Dragons are also more important than they used to be. They buffed them up where they take a bit more to, um, resources. You have to invest more resources to take them. They have more HP. But they also give you more. So if you can take it as a team in the early game, then you're going to get a lot more benefits than you did before. So that encourages stuff like Misfortune, Amumu, Maokai, you know, stuff that just has really good 5v5 team fighting um, across the board. So why Maokai in general over some of these other ones? Well, he just kind of does it all. And I've been a fan of Maokai for a long time of his kit. It's just the numbers weren't quite there. Um, but they did make some major adjustments uh, to his numbers to make him a bit more palatable, especially the tank version. So the AP version, I don't think, is um, that far behind. <clears throat> but the tank version really has established itself as kind of the, the major way that you want to go. So he has pretty good base stats. He's got 39 armor, which is, you know, on the high side. He's got 635 health. And I think he's got, what, 335 movement speed. So he's a little above average um, for most support champions. Maybe slightly below some of the biggest tanks. And they increased his healing um, a bit on his passive. So he's got pretty good sustain in lane against poke. It's not the best in the world, but he does have a little bit. Certainly more than something like Leona or Nautilus. And then the biggest uh, few changes, I think, are they made Bramble Smash a lot more valuable. So it does way more damage than it used to do. Now it does um, 245 base plus 3% of their max HP plus an additional 40% um, max HP. And they also made it do extra damage to monsters. So he's viable in the jungle. And that's another kind of unspoken perk of Maokai is he can technically be played in three different roles pretty reasonably. So that matters a lot more in pro, which is why you're seeing him all over the place in pro. Although he mostly gets picked, I think, for top in pro. Um, but in theory, that is going to make it more difficult for your team, especially the higher the elo goes, for the enemy team, rather, to um, sort of understand the matchups and counterpick either you or other people on your team. So it's a good flex pick, does pretty high base damage, low cooldown, um... 600 range, not the highest, but you can still poke with it early against some of these lower range ADCs like Kai'Sa, um, potentially. And it's like pretty reasonable wave clear. Like it has no drop off if you send the shockwave through the minions. So that's going to help you push in um, early on. If you have a Caitlyn or a Misfortune or something like that, it can help you. And it also has a displacement and a knockback. So if you time it correctly, then you can stop mobility with it. So if you have you know, a Zac flying in or a, um, a Rakan trying to jump on your ADC or, um, you know, Nautilus or Leona, they hook your ADC and they're trying to go in. If you can get between them and then use that Q, then you can displace them and knock them out of their movement. Um, or if you, you know, engage on a Tristana with your W and you just wait a moment and then when she tries to jump away, you do this, it can knock her out of her flight too. So really handy ability, kind of, almost like a trickier to use Thresh Flay um, if you're really trying to like like play it to maximum expertise. But even if you don't get that little knockback at the perfect time, it still provides a nice slow and still does pretty good AoE damage on a low cooldown. So 
very good, applies, you know, quite a bit of pressure in team fight situations. Then you have your W, and this is really, really nice because it's basically undodgeable, right? Like, once you start going at them with this W, then they can flash away, they can blink away, and you got to be careful if they pull you under tower. You don't want that to happen. Um, but other than that, they're not getting away from this. And once you get on them with that W, uh, then you're going to lock them up, right? With your Q plus your ultimate, they're going to be CC'd for like four seconds. So it's pretty much they're dead if you hit them with W. Now, the only drawback of that is it's very short range. So it's only got 525 range. Um, so it is hard just to get people out of nowhere. Um, and that's why I think a lot of the pro people that I was looking at uh, I believe they were taking Everfrost on him. Now that might have, I don't remember if that was for top lane or that's only for support. I don't know if we're going to see I see all rolls. No, that I get maybe that was a Mumu I was thinking of. Um, so Aftershock is, it looks like the, the go-to there, but um if you can t if you can find a way to take something like hex flash and it looks like that's what a lot of people are doing as a secondary that can help you out out of bushes or especially when someone's not expecting it like he really needs to get that extra range to land the w or you can you know gank him from really odd angles potentially with hex flash so you do get a lot of value with hex flash on malachi um and that also especially as a support like you're not seeing it a ton here because most of these are top laners but um on Wallalytics, when you look at the support version, a lot of people like to rush um, Dead Man's Plate, which seems a little weird, but you know the main reason there is your entire like weakness is centered around your short range. So if you can get into range easier, if you can just run at someone and get them with your W, they're probably dead. You don't need as much CDR, like it's good, but usually one rotation of your spells is gonna be enough to kill somebody. Um, so, that's really, really handy. Again, you just have to find ways to get into range. So if you have your flash up and a gank comes in, it's virtually guaranteed you're going to kill them, right? Because even if they flash your flash, if you're just there for that one millisecond to press W, you're still going to catch them. They can't dodge it. So really, really good ability. It's almost like a Nautilus R, right? Not quite as potent, but in the sense that it can't be dodged, but it's just a normal ability. So quite strong, um, pretty good root duration. And then, of course, you've got your sapling toss. Now, this was a cornerstone of the AP Malachi builds of yore, but they have taken that off to where um, it doesn't do a percentage of the enemy's max health anymore. They've moved that over to the Q. So they've kind of split that a little bit, where the, the E used to do a percentage of your max health and a percentage of the enemy's max health, and it used to have a pretty high base damage. So it's still okay, like 310 base damage plus, you know, 12% of your bonus health plus 80% of your AP is still, like, really good. <laughs> um, and obviously the way that it ticks, I think for two and a half seconds, it's going to trigger Demonic, you know, multiple times. Or Leandris. A lot of people don't go Leandris because it doesn't have health on it. But Demonic is certainly pretty good on him. So... You can go that way if you want, but even if you just keep one point in it, which is what most people are doing with kind of the tank Malachi build, if you just keep one point, it still provides excellent scouting. So it still stays up for the same amount of time, no matter how many points you put in it. So it gives you a ton of free wards um, and free scouting. And like the base damage is still like, it's not amazing, let's be honest, but it's not like completely inconsequential, even with one point. You know, if you're getting tanky stuff, you've got a thousand bonus health. Um, you know, you're still looking at somewhere around 200 something damage. So that's still pretty good. And then of course you have your R, um, which just has insane range, like 3000 range. Now it moves very slowly, but if you catch people in choke points or you're able to cut them off with this, uh, it's really, really hard to dodge this because it's just so freaking wide. Like it takes up the whole screen. Now the enemy can in theory play around this if they all stack up and just have like one tank soak one of the brambles because they don't go through champions. As soon as it hits one champion, anyone else that's behind them doesn't get hit. So you have to kind of group up. But in a lot of these compositions that'll run Malachi, if they have something like a Misfortune that goes with that, or an Amumu support, if it's Malachi top, which isn't, you know, 
really germane to what we're talking about. But it just forces people to group up if they want to outplay it. And guess what? When you group up like that, you're going to get blown up by a lot of stuff that's in the meta right now. So it's really, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't um, with that Malachi ultimate. Either you don't group up and it roots everyone separately, or you do group up and then you're really vulnerable to, you know, other kind of AoE burst damage. So he just puts the enemy in really weird positions. Um, he has a ton of CC. He gets lots of free scouting. He synergizes very well with a lot of the popular items like even Shroud right now. Um, demonic and then you can still or you can still get your standard Knight's Vow or Zeke's or whatever he can use them all really well um, and you know he does have good engage if your flash is up or if you have hex flash or if you get a flank on him um, he can engage it's just a little bit harder to do it out of nowhere you know like it is with Nautilus or um, Leona if you're just like a ramming but if you get the dead man's plate or um, and boots of swiftness which is what a lot of people do you can typically just come in from the flank and a lot of people aren't going to be able to get away from you. So yeah, extremely strong, especially in these 5v5 team fight comps, which is the matter right now. So overall, he's a total menace. I think you should definitely consider banning him if you're not going to play him. Uh, and he does shut down a lot of other champions. Um, on this list. I think, I don't know his exact win rate against Nautilus and Leona, but I feel like it's pretty good because he's going to have more CC than them. You know, he does have better vision control than they do, so it's less likely he's going to get ganked. He's going to be able to make more informed decisions. I think he does more damage um, in a lot of situations than either one of them does. And he has things that um, are very good at countering both of them. So, like, his Q can interact with their hooks. Um, you know, his W can lock them up. They don't have a lot of great ways to get away if he engages on them. So, I, I think he has a lot more options with how to navigate those matchups. So very very strong definitely consider uh picking malachi and then amumu is another one who's mixed i mean he does have a high win rate right now i know in pro play his win rate is really high and so is malachi's in pro in solo queue it's pretty good um my thoughts on amumu are um he's very good if you have a a couple of conditions if you have something that's very good early game um he can be pretty strong. Where's... There we go. If you have both of your Q stored up and you get your E, then like that level 2 all-in is very, very strong because your Q does you know so much damage if you hit both of them. I think that's some of the most damage of any level 2 um, in the bot lane. So there's that. He does have a pretty reasonable win rate right now. Um, show his abilities... Yeah, here we go. So basically, like level two, you can get 140 damage with what like 170 percent AP ratio. Now you're not gonna have a lot of AP, but if you take double AP runes, that's what 18. So that's like an extra 22 damage or something. That's a lot of damage level two. And then your E is like okay. It's like 75 extra damage uh, with a 50 percent ratio. So I don't know like perfect math on that but it's somewhere if you include like the ap runes and um you know everything else it's well north of 200 damage it's like 250 damage and when you think that a lot of champions in the early game are probably going to be clocking in at like 600 maybe 700 damage with their items and runes and everything that's a lot that's like a third to you know half of their hp just right off the bat Right, not including your ignite, which is going to do more. Not including your auto attacks if your ADC has a pulse and does anything. So it is a lot of damage in the early game if you hit both bandages, right? Which if you hit the first one, they're probably going to have to flash, or it's highly likely you're going to hit the second one. Um, so he does have very good all-in pressure. Uh, he does provide um, some excellent sort of additional damage if. Uh, your team has a lot of AP damage. Now, even Shroud, I'm not 100% increasing the damage they take by 10%. So I, th I believe that stacks multiplicatively pre minute. I I'm not sure. So what, what I'm wondering is if they take 100 damage, does it check even shroud first 100 magic damage and go to 110 and then does it check 10 percent of that 
um, on top of it and then go to 121, right, instead of 120. But is that really going to matter a lot? It basically, it, it, it's a lot of stacking. It's a lot of extra damage with even Shroud if you get this item. Um, as long as your team has, you know, pretty good AP champions with it. Now, Misfortune is, you know, the big ticket here with Amumu. That's been a combo since Season 1. If both of those are ever in the meta at the same time, historically it's been a the Mumu jungle. But Amumu support works now, um, partially because Misfortune support is so popular, but also because they gave it this double charge on the bandage, which gives him a lot of extra pressure in the early game. Uh, and they gave him this passive where he gets the extra true damage off of his ult or his auto attack. So whenever he does his ult, everybody's vulnerable to the CC. They also made it to where it's a stun um, on his uh, ultimate. They changed that like a couple of seasons ago or whenever he first was people were trying him out of support and that's a pretty big upgrade over um just being rooted because if you're rooted um then something like someone like if you root a support they can't use mikhail's on themselves that type of thing and if people are rooted like there are some things they can do to break roots or they can still auto attack if they're stunned they can't do anything other than like use cleanse or qss or something like that so Anyways, really good all-in early damage. If you can snowball, really good team fight damage. You know, like nice AP ratios. You don't build a lot of AP. Um, but just being able to curse people with that even shroud, he has a very, very good one-item power spike for team fights. Um, especially if everybody's going to be grouping up. So as the game goes on, I feel like he can kind of fall off. His Q is a bit harder to hit. Than some of the other abilities out there i don't it's got 1100 range but it's a very slender hitbox so it, it can be a little challenging and you're not that tanky late game so early on like this e will help you out against a lot of um like minion damage that you're going to be taking when you go all in because it blocks like a, a flat amount now it can only block 50 percent, but still like that's a lot of minion damage you're blocking if you're fighting in the minions and they're fighting in the minions you know, you might save 100 to 150 damage off of that passive. So very good early game, but just doesn't scale particularly well late game, particularly with a Mumu support, because you're not going to have a lot of flat armor and magic resist. You know, even Shroud has like 20, I don't even remember what it is, like 25 or 30 armor or something on it. Um, yeah, 30 armor. And then a lot of times your second item will be something like Knight's Vow that has no armor on it, or maybe Zeke's, which will have like another 30. So you're not going to get that much benefit out of this later in the game um your w does stay relevant it's like percentage max health but again like that's pretty good for taking barons and dragons i guess as far as like support contribution to damage but it feels like it's not that much late game so it's really just how much can you snowball early with him and how valuable is that ult like how much is everyone going to be grouped um later on and if you can and what can your team do with it when you cc him so if you have that misfortune or you've got an azir or you know you just have some other champs that just do a lot of damage and a lot of cc he's going to be really good so the difference with him and maokai i think is it's easier to outplay the amumu potentially maokai is so hard to outplay because that w is just point click follows people whereas you can always flash the amumu q if you're fast enough um or, I mean, sometimes you can even, after he hits you with the Q, you might even be able to flash his ult um, if you're fast enough or, like, do some kind of reaction to it. Uh, and Maokai's ultimate is, like, way easier to hit than Amumu's. Like, Amumu does, it is a pretty big hitbox on it. I think it's, like, what, yeah, 550 radius. So it's still a pretty good hitbox. But, um, you know, if the enemy sees it coming, like, they're all going to try to spread out as much as they can. So he's still pretty good. My, my experiences with him or he just gets completely walloped late game like just blown out if you fall behind or if you're just ever caught out like he has no mobility so you're just going to get blown up his ult's also a really long cooldown so it's great for team fights but it's not necessarily the best for like roaming around and just trying to take over the game that way right versus like leona's ult's 90 seconds so you could just run around and gank you know middle like every minute or something after cooldown reduction or you know leona just has a lot more uptime and <coughs> other champions have more cc so he's got this one piece here and then he has his q which is you know one short piece it's like for one second and then they get a couple of seconds of breathing room and time to dodge the second one if they want 
So I just feel like there's more outplay potential. Other champions have more CC. But if what you want is just really that early game, just bully, let's just blow them up potential, and like one of the strongest, like level six, let's go contest dragon, or let's go dive them, um, and just force this fight, uh, he's going to be one of the stronger options. So I wasn't really sure where to put him, but I went ahead and just honored, put him in tier two, just because he is so dominant in pro. He's not that hard to play. Um, and he does have like a 52.5% win rate, which is one of the highest in solo Q2. So we'll go ahead and put him up there. Um, Rakan, everybody knows how I feel about Rakan. Like, you know, there is an argument now that you could put him down to tier two. And, you know, maybe that's more appropriate for people that don't have a lot of experience on Rakan. But he did get a couple of buffs on this patch. I still think he is a very good champion just because he's so versatile. Yes, his matchup into Maokai is not outstanding. I think the Moo Moo is probably better than people might think. Like, the ult is pretty good um, if you hit Rakan with it, but Rakan also has multiple, like, ways to get out of there, right? Like, it's really hard to catch him um, in that ultimate. You just have to be patient and just wait for the Moo to ult first and then go in and try to clean up. Um, try to save whoever you can save, you know, if you're Rakan. So I think there are... Um, there are some tough matchups in the meta right now with Rakan, but there are some other matchups that were tough that are cycling out of the meta too. So like Lulu uh, is pretty hard to deal with as Rakan, like Lulu is very obnoxious. Janna is obnoxious. Uh, and both of those are kind of circling out of the meta. Blitzcrank's becoming very popular right now. Rakan is excellent against Blitzcrank because you can dodge all of his crap. Um, and usually you're going to be able to make more plays later on. Yes, if he hooks someone, you're not going to be able to save him. But historically, I feel like it's a good matchup. You know, having played it dozens, if not hundreds of times over the years. Hundreds might be a stretch, but I've, I've played it a lot. And it feels like it's a good matchup. Um, and then I still think that his matchup into Leona is quite good. And his matchup into Nautilus is a little more mixed, but I still think it's a, it's a playable matchup. It's a reasonable matchup. Renata Glask is okay. It depends on the situation. It's not fantastic. But I feel like the Amumu matchup's pretty good. The Maokai matchup's horrible. Like, you, you better watch out if you're against Maokai support. That's really, really bad. You do not want to play against Maokai's Rakan. So it's kind of a mixed bag, but I think that his matchup on a lot of these top-end picks is neutral to good. Um, and I don't think there are a ton of other picks that can say that outside of, like, Maokai. So, yes, he does take a little more skill, but if you do have the skill to navigate it, if you're making the correct decisions in terms of your itemization, your positioning... And, you know, just your timing, where you should be, when you should roam, when you shouldn't. Um, then I still think Rakan's really good. Those AP buffs will help him out normally, even if he just gets Shirelia's. And if you want to get cute and try out Everfrost or Night Harvester and try to bring that back, which maybe I'll try it out um, again on stream, we'll see. Then that could give you another burst option um, to potentially blow people up. But the Even Shroud change has actually been quite good on Rakan, too. I've been winning a lot with that build. Um, recently so he's a pretty good beneficiary of even shroud also and then we've also got uh renata glask now i'm not really sure why she's not doing better she has like no pro presence i'm i think or like virtually none um you would think in theory that she would be very good against engaged champions because she can save like one person from getting blown up i, I think the problem is stuff like maokai and amumu have so much like AoE CC that just saving one person is not enough um, in some of these situations where you're forcing the 5v5 team fights. There's just going to be so many people that are CC'd and getting blown up at the same time potentially. Now the fact that she does have pretty long range for a support means that um, she can spread out and possibly not get hit by the Amumu. She shouldn't ever really be getting hit by the Amumu honestly. Um, but the Maokai is still going to be a menace. So I'm not entirely sure. Maybe it's an ADC thing that she just doesn't synergize with Misfortune as well um, as some of the other picks. But I still feel like she has the potential. Um, Even Shroud seems like it should be a good item on her. Let me pull this up here and just kind of see what people are doing. Again, there's not a lot of data um, on this patch yet because it just came out today. But in theory, like she used to get Shirelia's, which helped people with engage. But I could see even Shroud being a thing too, because like her ult would trigger it, her Q would trigger it, um, the slow would not trigger it on her E, so maybe that's a thing. But 
Looks like a lot of people still like Shirelia's. Yeah, even Shroud's not super popular. I don't know. So maybe Shirelia's is still the, the play. Um, but obviously you have the ultimate, which is really good counter engage. Like it's very slow moving, but it's got a huge hitbox. If everyone's trying to group up, you do that R. So if like Malachi is ulting you, you can ult the Malachi's team and you guys will, I guess, cancel each other out maybe. Um, they'll be fighting each other for half of the duration of the route. Um, so he does kind of have that. He, she has the scaling on her W as well. So if something like Jinx becomes more popular with that buff, um, then maybe this will come into play. Obviously, the attack speed doesn't always matter the most on like a Misfortune or a Jin or an Ezreal. Um, but if you do see, you know, Jinx is coming back in or you've got, I don't know, like a Cogmaw, maybe if there are still some Sivers being played out there, um, you could see it work. She does have a pretty high win rate. I mean, she's got almost a 53% win rate. So I think she deserves the S spot, even though she's not getting a ton of attention, um, at least not in pro. And I haven't seen her a ton in solo queue. I think she's still pretty good. You know, the one danger if you're playing her is you can get caught out on um, rotations because you don't have any mobility. And your W doesn't help if someone just gets blown up immediately and everyone just, like, disengages, right? Like, it's very good if you're hard committed to a 5v5 fight and your person's going to be able to come back to life and get that assist to get the revive. But... Um, if people are just running in and assassinating you, then that's not going to be as good. Now, the fact that they nerfed um, Eclipse means that those types of items may not, or those types of champions that like those items, like the Zeds, in theory, the Talons, I mean, they can just get Dustblade instead. That maybe that makes them less um, appealing, potentially. So, I don't know. But I still think she deserves a pretty top spot. we got to move a little faster because I do have to meet with some students uh, here in a moment. I just want to spend a little time on the top ones. Um, Janna, still pretty good. Uh, I think the big issue with Janna, and it has always been my issue with Janna, or not always, but like in the last few seasons, is you just don't have any way to like interact with the enemy like proactively, right? Like you're waiting for them to come onto you, and so you're really just hoping that your team makes smart decisions about engages. And I just don't feel like that's a great place to be right now. Um, a lot of popular champions and other roles still aren't engaged. You're seeing more of it. Like, you are seeing Hecarim. Um, you are seeing Malachi top. So we're kind of rotating back towards, you know, you might have some more tanks um, in other roles again. But I just don't like leaving it up to my team to decide the fights. Like, I know it's annoying and when your team doesn't follow up and, you know, you have a good engage and it just fails and you die and it just looks terrible. Like, I get the frustration with that, and I know that's why some people like playing Enchanters because they don't want to make the decision on the engage. Um, or they just get frustrated because they think their team never follows up. But in my opinion, the more frustrating thing is sitting there in like a 35 minute game and basically feeling like I'm just watching the game because I don't have any way to start a fight. Like, I'm just sitting there pinging, you know, just trying to drag my team into, you know, getting a good fight, but they just won't do it. People just resort to A-ramming, or more likely, people are just running around doing their own thing, and then they get caught and die. Like, someone's trying to farm golems, you know, at 40 minutes into the game when Baron spawned or something. You know, it's just dumb stuff like that. It feels like it happens. So, I just feel like, personally, I would want to be more proactive and, you know, try to set up plays and make those plays myself. But Janna still does have a pretty good win rate. It has dropped significantly. It's no longer that 53 to 54. It's closer to 51. But in theory, like, she should still be okay against, you know, engaged champs. It's kind of like, um, you know, what I was just saying about Renata, though, is it's just like there might just be such an overwhelming amount of CC from some of these champions, like Malachi, Amumu, or Nautilus, that like just your ultimate's just not gonna do it on the peel it might still work with the moo moo but like it's really hard to deal with maokai like when maokai ults like because your ult's not gonna stop that really um and you know when he gets in range where you could knock him back with your r he goes untargetable with the w so he's still gonna get on you um or whoever he's trying to get on so it's just really really hard to peel the maokai um, or if he flash Ws or whatever. It's just so hard to interact with that champion. And he's just such a like powerful presence right now in the meta that I think that's definitely brought her down a little bit. 
So she still can be good. She can still scale. She's just not proactive enough. And the kinds of engage that's out there right now, it's not just your old school, you know, like Leona, Nautilus type of stuff. And Nautilus can be a tricky cover too, but it's it's the Maokai. Also, the prominence of Blitzcrank. Blitz is historically pretty good against Janna because if you pull someone out of position, she really doesn't have a lot of tools. I mean, she can walk up an ult to try to help, but usually you blow them up so fast, it's, it's difficult to deal with. So... That's kind of a bad matchup, um, but she she does scale. She can work. Uh, I would just probably prefer Renata um, if you want to peel and protect type of champion. I think Renata's got a better steroid with her W, and it also protects a single target better. Um, I think than Janna does, and she just has a, a more proactive R. Like it's not the best thing in the world to open with. Usually, you want them to come into you, but if you can throw it out of brush or just at a really good angle near a choke point or something, you can still make a play with it. So. Anyways, um, I'd just rather play Renata in most situations where I'd want Janna right now. And then Nautilus, not a lot has changed. Even Shroud is a thing. It's strong. It's very good on Nautilus. Um, he still has that point-click ultimate. Almost impossible to get away from. He still has really strong engage. Now it's going to be tough if you've got, you know, a Maokai standing in front of you or, um, you know, a potential Amumu that's looking to engage on you and blow you up uh, early on because you aren't that tanky as Nautilus, especially if you try to go Glacial, which is what a lot of people are doing with him these days. Um, that can be rough. And, you know, using all of your cooldowns just to have Renata Glass save the person and, you know, turn the fight around is also really obnoxious. So if you can find the good engages with comps or you can roam around, he still is a very good team fighting tank. He just doesn't put up as much damage or um, consistent CC as... Um, so Malachi is going to have more consistent CC on more targets, I think, with higher reliability. He also has better scouting, obviously, with like his seeds. And then Amumu is just going to put out a lot more potential burst damage with the double stacking of the passive with the Even Shroud and just your higher base damage um, on your abilities. So you want the damage, you go Amumu. You want more CC, you go Malachi. You just want a longer, more reliable engage, you go Nautilus, I think, because you still do have that really like fat hitbox on the hook and it's got a pretty long range um so he still has a place in the meta but he's just getting like completely blasted um at worlds and obviously that's a different kind of meta right but i don't think it, it's that far off from what you would see uh in solo queue i think his win rate i didn't look at it and i know we're almost out of time but it's probably like 48 percent or something just because i don't think it's an amazing matchup into the top picks but i still respect it that it, it's you know very reliable and can put up a lot of cc so um yeah he's got a 22 percent win rate right now in pro and he's picked pretty frequently so that's that's bad that's a losing matchup in almost everybody <laughs> right so that's that's really rough um now again not an insane sample size but good but troubled in a lot of matchups leona very similar to how she's always been very low cooldowns really high uptime on a lot of your cc very dangerous doesn't have a reverse gear um doesn't do as much damage as like in early on but if you snowball with her she is so hard to get away from just because that ult is always up she's historically very good with misfortune or draven or like anything else that can bully early and start snowballing so she still has a place in the meta, especially if you can find good roam timings in the jungle or in the mid, or if you just have a snowball -y bot lane where you're just going to be able to kill him a lot. She can be pretty good. Blitzcrank I already talked about. I don't think the meta is going to shift that much. His win rate's going to go up just because his numbers are up a little bit. Um, but I don't think a lot's going to change. You could try the um, the like how the, the freaking glacial thing. Um, the not Frost Queen. Y'all know what the hell I'm talking about. The, the thing that roots people, the AP item. You could try that on him. I'm, I still think most people probably just want to go Even Shroud or Locket on him. I think Even Shroud's probably it. Everfrost. There we go. Um, so you could try Everfrost. That might help out with bursts a little bit more. It does give you AP, which is nice too. So you can throw like more than two hooks and not be out of mana. So that is helpful. You still do get some HP out of it. But Even Shroud's probably the safer option if you want to be able to get in there and throw down some auto attacks which are more valuable now with your W changes. So he's still pretty good. Um, I'm not sure about the matchup into tanks like Maokai, Amumu, stuff like that. Typically those aren't what's Crank's strong point. But, um, you know, if you land those hooks, he can kill almost anything in the early game. Seraphine's still okay. You don't see her a lot, but with the teamfight meta, 
really strong team fight ultimate really good pressure in the early game she can still get stuff like Shirelia's moonstone was nerfed you can still get it Shirelia's is still pretty good so if you want a nice like team fighting long range support that can also pressure early maybe seraphine's your pick i think she's underrated i think she's still pretty good might even deserve to be s tier um, but i've got her down in a for now just because if you get engaged on you're dead and she doesn't have a lot of mobility and a lot of these champions these top picks are going to exploit you if you don't have mobility and then um, Sona's the last one. So uh, she did get some buffs on this patch. Like we mentioned before, it's like 5 or 10 extra damage on her Q. I just don't think it's quite enough. She's still pretty low range. Um, she does scale exceptionally well, but I would just rather play Seraphine most of the time just because Seraphine's longer range and has better wave clear. So you can actually help your ADC push in, which is going to make it a lot harder for like the Nautilus and the Leona to engage on you if they're having to, you know, just last hit under tower the whole time. <clears throat> so I put her up here just out of respect just because she can scale her win rate's probably still like 52% or something um, so like in places like silver where people aren't going to be as proactive they aren't going to engage on you as much silver gold maybe I still think she can be really good once you get higher than that it's going to be a bit tougher and I'd probably prefer Seraphine um, last few here uh, Lulu can still be good if you have the right um, champs with her. So, like, Kog'Maw can still be pretty good. Um, Jinx can still be pretty good with her. It's just you don't have a lot of mobility. Um, and if you do get, you know, caught out in CC, you are going to die. She has been nerfed pretty heavily. But, I mean, she's still good. She's still probably, like, 50 or 51%. She still scales well. It's just... You, she can still work if you have another front line. So if you have like a Hecarim to go with her in jungle or a Maokai or an Orn or something top lane, like she can still work. But um, without having that front line, it can be really vulnerable for the champs that she's good with because usually they're immobile champs that scale really well with attack speed to like utilize your passive well. So like Twitch, Cog, Jinx, and all of those champs are going to be very weak to this these engaged types of champs if... Um, oh, you guys can't see my... Cursor, but with, with the top tier engaged champs unless you have some kind of brick wall on the front line um same thing with yumi can scale but gonna be vulnerable to engage if you don't have more tanks same thing with soraka um and then like zyra can be good she can apply early pressure and she's really good anti-engage if they're trying to go into you with the amumu and the maokai it's just hard to make your own plays once the lane is over you can kill people out of bushes but it just kind of limits your proactivity. But she's still pretty good against some of these engaged champs. Um, and then Tom Kinch, we already talked about it. I'm not sure. He might just still be bad. But maybe the AP can work some options, you know, for him. I don't know. He can still get engaged on. But, like, if you can land your Tongue Lash and then land a W on somebody, maybe it's good. Maybe it's a lot of damage. So, I think if you want to save people, Renata is probably just better at doing that right now, considering her ability is just a normal ability. It's like 20 seconds. So, somehow that's okay. But, like, Tom Kinch's old, like, eat is not okay. I agree with nerfing the eat. I think it should be a much, much lower cooldown. I think it should be like a 60 second cooldown. Like, okay, you can use this once, you know, every fight, but only once type of thing. But with Renata, you can do that crap twice in some fights. It's ridiculous. Anyways. Um,. Okay, well, that's going to be it. Um, you know, stuff like Morgana can be good, too, at black shielding some of this. She just doesn't do much else beside that. Um, like, you do have the bind, which is still pretty good. So a lot of people like to pick Morgan to engage, and it's it's okay. I would just rather be, like, in the Renata type of area um, if you're looking for that. Uh, Rel has picked up. Honestly, I haven't played against it, but I think she got specifically buffed a couple of patches ago, and then Even Shroud is pretty good on her. So she has a hard time engaging. I think of her more as a peeler tank, kind of like a Tarek or a Tom Kench or a Braum. And I just feel like those aren't super optimal again because it's really hard to make your own plays. I know she can, you know, jump out of bushes and stuff like that. Like she can make plays. It's just harder to do it than it is on, you know, like a Maokai or a Nautilus or a Rakan or something like that. So she's still pretty good. I'm just not sure where I would want to play her instead of these other champs, but her win rate's pretty good. Um, and then that's that's pretty much it for all the a lot of the most notable ones. The Ash has fallen off quite a bit. I haven't seen her a ton. I don't remember if they even nerfed anything about her, but she's just so vulnerable to getting engaged on. Um, and some of these tanks are harder to blow up if you hit them with an arrow before they're going to wake up out of the stun. So um, maybe she's still playable. I don't know, but I haven't seen it a lot um, in recent times. So I'm not quite sure what happened there, but. 
Anyways, okay. Well, that's going to be it. We'll keep it um, relatively short. We'll keep it under an hour this time. I do have to go meet with some students. Um, but thank you all very much for tuning in. As always, I appreciate it. Be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content. Come by, check out the stream. Starts around 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Still going to be playing a, a pretty good chunk of Rakan, but I have been trying out some more Maokai lately, and there's a chance I might play some Amumu. So come by, check it out, see what you think. Come have a good conversation with us. And we'll see you next time. Have a good day.